Good morning, everyone. Eh, eh, welcome, everyone. Bienvenidos, eh, todas y todos. Welcome to our conference, Migration in the Americas, the workings of Collective Hope. It's a pleasure uh, to welcome you all. My name is Jose Miguel Cruz. I'm the Director of Research of the Kimberly Green Latin America and Caribbean Center. Uh, and this is uh, the first of different uh, events and panels in a two-day conference on migration in the Americas. Uh, let me introduce you to President Luis Guillermo Solis, who will be providing the welcome uh, remarks for, for our conference. Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera served as president of Costa Rica from 2014 to 2018. He's currently the interim director of the Kimberly Green Latin American Caribbean Center at Florida International University. In 1984, he began his service to Costa Rica in the foreign ministry, leading Costa Rican delegations to the United Nations, the Organization of American States and the European Union. He was the country's ambassador for Central American Affairs and for two decades held the office of Secretary General of the Governing National Liberation Party. He previously thought, taught at the University of Michigan and in 1999, he was a full, Fulbright Scholar at FIU. So Liz is a graduate of the University of Costa Rica and has a master's degree in political science and sociology from Tulane University. He has published more than 10 books and dozens of articles for professional journals. Thank you, President Solis, for uh, inaugurating this conference. And uh, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Miguel. Good morning to all. Welcome to this event on behalf of all the organizing parties and particularly from the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center at FIU. We appreciate your being with us. We acknowledge your presence and we are very thankful that you were able to join us. I, uh, like, I would like to, to say a few words of Jose Miguel Cruz's uh, efforts with his colleagues and the participants, specialists, practitioners that are going to be at this event during the next couple of, 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 of days. Uh, we are very proud of their work and, and understanding the many commitments they have are particularly grateful of their uh, gracious presence women, with, with us. It's, it's much appreciated. Um, I would like to take this opportunity. I, I would not be able to do otherwise to say a few words on, on the issue that gathers us, uh, because I, I think it has become clear that it is here to stay and it has become one of the most salient points in the hemispheric agenda. Although I must say, that migrations uh, is a phenomenon that, um, that transcends geography, it transcends time as well. And, and throughout the ages, we've seen human beings moving from one place to another, away from the areas of, uh, of origin due to many different kinds of issues. Uh, some of them had to do with nature, others had, were anthropogenic, therefore associated to human activities, but all of them tend to be dramatic. And I say this because it's not with pleasure that human beings move around. Uh, we like to be where we dwell, where we are familiar with the entour, and going away is always a challenge. It's always a challenge. Um, people seldom migrate if they can be comfortable or mostly comfortable where they are. And um, if they're satisfied with their circumstance of life, even more so. So uh, one thing that I want to, to highlight, the first thing I would highlight is the fact that this has been happening in our age, most than, most, it, most than in other ages, is here to stay. It's happening not only in the Americas, but, but el elsewhere. And it, it entails uh, challenges to human communities in, in general. Um, and in saying that migrations are not joyous events for the most part, I would like to say that they entail fears, uncertainties, um, real physical and psychological uh, dangers, and their impact affects uh, both um, 
the most well impacts the, the, the most vulnerable. Uh, and I, I must say this because the impact of migrations, as we know, uh, is, is general, but tends to affect more women, children, the elderly, uh, because of, of, of the way in which the dynamics of migration, the fact that we have, people have to walk over long distances, that they have to face uh, dangers of, of different threats, their lives of different nature is something that needs to be uh, uh, highlighted. And, and also because when they arrive to a new place, those who live there treat, treat them as threatening and, uh, and therefore continue to uh, put additional pressures to what is already a very dire circumstance. Um, so mm, for the most part, we've seen that migration policies in the places where migrants arrive are, sel are, are seldom um, formulated thinking in humanitarian aspects. Uh, in, in one of our latest issues of, of the journal of the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean centers, we refer to migrations as hardships of hope. How, how they, the, the migrants suffered hardships from hope, of hope. Of hope. Um, so we, we have come to realize uh, that one very significant part of migrations has to do with migration policies not being humanitarian, not responding to the human rights that migrants have, and also the fact that there's a lack of international uh, regulations uh, pertaining migrants. We have some for refugees, or there are another, uh, other uh, regulations that the United Nations has tutelaged for for, for, for them, but not for migrants. And in, in that uh, sense, the human rights humanitarian approach to migration is something that our conference in the next couple of days is going to do. And I welcome that. Migrants are not even uh, to be seen in any other way as persons, not as numbers. And even when we all admit that uh, it's very difficult to imagine countries not having some kind of restriction to migrations, open borders clearly is not an option for most countries. It is true that more intelligent, more inclusive, more enlightened uh, perspective of migration as humanitarian uh, phenomena should be uh, adopted. So I, I, I welcome uh, Jose Miguel and his colleagues perspective of putting this <clears throat> at the forefront of our common uh, recollections. <clears throat> Now, in saying that migrations uh, are global, I should also see, say that Latin America, as other underdeveloped regions of the world, has been hard hit by migrations, particularly. Um, and this, we, we, we've also learned, it's not a south-north phenomenon only. We have, in our hemisphere, lots of examples of south-south migrations. And I welcome the fact, also, that we're going to be talking about that in this event. In other words, we see Venezuelans going to Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and Brazil. We see Nicaraguans traveling to Costa Rica. We see Bolivians going to Argentina. We see Haitians going everywhere. Um, so um, we, we, we have to, to address uh, these uh, migration issues, um, also bearing in mind that there are significant differences among them. And yes, of course, we would like to pay special attention of migrants coming from uh, Latin America to the United States and most particularly uh, Central American migrants coming to the United States, those from the uh, Northern Triangle. But that is not by any means uh, the only uh, reality that we're facing and important as it is for the North American, uh, in the North American context, and I, I can only be grateful for the participation of organizations that understand that beyond the borders of the United States and the presence of, Lloyd, the presence of former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, Lloyd, As Lloyd Asworth, Axworthy is a testament to that, bears testament to this. Um, I understand that we need to, to address this from a US perspective too. And at the threshold of the next conference, 
of the next summit of the Americas, I also find it very timely that we can provide uh, a recollection of what has been the case for Latin American migrations and what should be the path uh, forward. And in, in that regard, I would like to bring about just a very short reflection on economic issues and how migrations should be uh, seen as productive and positive for nations. Um, I'm not gonna get into that in, in great detail, nor is the conference gonna do that, but let's think of the benefits of migrations too. And I say this because I was really surprised in looking at the contributions that so-called illegal aliens do uh, to, to the American economy to learn that to the IRS, illegal, illegal migrants pay around $11 billion a year as part of the um, law requirements that was enacted under the Clinton administration that supposedly would eventually provide some uh, facilities to these migrants who pay taxes uh, if they were to have um, their status regularized. This has never happened. It is not going to happen in the future. And yet migrants, illegal migrants, continue to pay uh, those huge amounts of money to the government of the United States only with the illusion of a perhaps facilitated process of migration regularization. So if you, if you take other uh, parts of the economy, including the work in construction, the work in services, particularly tourism, uh, the way in which uh, migrants work in agriculture, in, in the cattle industry, et cetera, just gives you, an, uh, gives you an idea of how there are possibilities that are not being uh, considered at this time, probably because of uh, the inconveniences in terms of wages and, and other factors associated to expenses that one would probably uh, could um, deal with in a different way if a more enlightened, more humanitarian maybe even more intelligent uh, approach to migrations could be, could be adopted. Finally, I would like to say that migrations are not gonna be a way, they are not gonna be solved by repression and by more uh, forces of the of, of, of law, law forces or law enforcement uh, personnel in the border. They are not gonna be stopped by any wall. Uh, and therefore we have to, to think in these new approaches uh, looking for advantages to move forward. Once again, I, I want to thank all of you for being part of this exciting moment in LAC's uh, history, the creation of this uh, conference. Once again, Jose Miguel, I, I want to express my deepest gratitude for you uh, for uh, convening it and having your colleagues uh, participate in it and, and, and wish you the best uh, in in this uh, in this event, may your your reflections uh, today and tomorrow bring uh, advancement and uh, and betterment uh, to the policies of migrations in our hemisphere and beyond. I thank you very much. Thank you, President Solis. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to thank you for the support. For this initiative, we have been uh, preparing, talking, working on this initiative for uh, several months now, and I appreciate all your support, especially your vision to promote uh, the idea of discussing migration as part of our agenda to to put on the table the issue of of, of rights of the migrant, of human rights in, in general. So thank you so much for 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 the support. I want to, to welcome all of you who are, who are joining now, who have been joining in the last uh, uh, 15, 15 minutes. This is our conference uh, on migration in the Americas, the workings of collective hope. We have the next panel in around 10, 10 minutes. In the meantime, for those of you who have just joined, let me provide some, some announcements. We have, Simultaneous interpretation in in the webinar. You can see you can choose your your channel English or Spanish in the 
in the bottom of interpretation in your screen. So feel free to use uh, to use uh, Spanish or, or or English. I want to thank our, our interpreters uh, today for for the great work. Uh, let me also um, uh, uh, tell you that we are live in Facebook. You can also join us uh, through Facebook. Uh, uh, looking for the LAC uh, website or LAC handle. Uh, I don't use Facebook, so I don't know exactly how is how is that called. But you can you can use the Facebook and join us over there. Uh, let me also provide a, a rundown of the conference in the next uh, for, for today and and, and tomorrow. Uh, the session that we are about to start in, as I said, in about uh, ten minutes, is focused on the drivers on Central Amer Central American migration, and we will have a really really distinguished uh, panel. Uh, will be moderated by Rafael Fernandez de Castro, who is the director of the Center for US-Mexican Studies at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, and, and we'll hear uh, presentations from Elizabeth Ferris, who is professor at Georgetown University and vice president and vice president of research at the World Refugee and Migration Council. We we'll also hear from Professor Cecilia Menjivar, she is a, prof a professor and Dorothy L. Mayer, Social Equities Chair at the University of California in, in Los Angeles, in UCLA. Uh, those in, those participation will be commented by Carla Cueva, former Minister of Human Rights in Honduras, also member of the Task Force on North and Central American Task Force on Migration at the World Refugee and Migration Council and Rafael also will join with, with his comments. That session will go from uh, 11.30 to 1.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern time. Then session two, we'll discuss the many migrations in the Americas. These are, as, prof, uh, as President Solis was saying, our interest is to focus on the many, many, the other migrations occurring in, in the Americas. And for that one, we will have a Professor Alison Wolf from the Universidad de los Andes, Professor Jonathan Hiskey from Vanderbilt University, and Professor Johanna Sainz uh, from the Regional Migration, who is a Regional Migration Advisor at the United Nations Development Program. Um, then to Close the today's uh, today's conference. We'll, in session three, we will have we will talk about the multiple and endless challenges of migrants and refugees. That session will go from uh, three forty-five to five forty-five, and we'll be joined by Ambassador Lloyd Axworthy, who is the chair of the World Refugee and Migration Council, and also former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Canada. Juan Pablo Gordillo, who's the Deputy Regional Coordinator of UNDP InfoSeguro Regional Hub. Uh, Mariana, professor Mariana Sanchez, who, who is a professor in the Department of Health Promotion and Disease Prevention at FIU. And Randolph McGrort McGrorty, who is Executive Director of the Catholic Legal Services at, at, the, at, at the Miami Archdiocese. Um, then tomorrow we'll have the presentation of a documentary film, uh, The Vertical Border, followed by a fire chat with director Sonia Wolf. And she will be joined by panelist Alejandro Alvarado, who is an associate professor of journalism and media director of the Spanish language journalist master program at FIU. And Juan Carlos Gomez, who is the director of the Carlos Costa Immigration Human Rights Clinic at FIU School of School of Law. So this is our program for the next uh, day and a half. I again I welcome you all to the to our uh, to our conference. We are five minutes away from starting the next panel. So I'll ask you to uh, give us uh, five minutes, and we'll be back on um, five minutes. Don't disconnect. Just uh, just stay right there and we'll be back in five minutes with our 
first session of the of the conference, the drivers of Central American migration. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, in the session one of the uh, title, the drivers of Central American migration. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Rafael Fernandez de Castro, who will be moderating uh, this, this session. Rafael Fernandez de Castro is a professor, the Aaron Feldman Family Chancellor's Endowed Chair in US Mexican Studies in Memory of David Feldman and Director of the University of California San Diego Center for US Mexican Studies, a former foreign policy advisor to President Felipe Calderon. He's an expert on bilateral relations between Mexico and the US. Fernandez de Castro is founder of the um, former chair of the Department of International Studies at Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, ITAM. Uh, he has published numerous academic articles and written several books, including Contemporary Use, Latin American Relations, Cooperation or Conflict in the 21st Century, and the United States and Mexico Between Partnership and Conflict with Jorge Dominguez. With, uh, with that, I'll give the floor to uh, Professor Fernando de Castro. Rafael. Thank you, Miguel. I I'm very happy to be here and, uh, and share this wonderful panel. Uh, thank you, Miguel, for, for, for the invitation. And thank you also to Luis Guillermo Solis for present, present Guillermo Solis. Uh, I must say that I, that I learned a lot uh, traveling with Miguel to Southern Mexico and to Central America. Uh, those were very good years. And thank you, Miguel. I always be indebted to you because I learned a lot about uh, what I would say social fabric in Latin America and, uh, and not only gangs, but especially social fabric. And, uh, and we were together looking at migrants uh, in, in, in Southern Mexico 20 years ago. And, uh, and, and now I live in this, uh, in the other Mexican border uh, next to the United States. So uh, Miguel, why don't I give you back the floor so you will introduce the three panelists and then I, 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 we will start the panel. Absolutely. Uh, so, so it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists for, for today. Uh, first, we will hear from Elizabeth Ferris. Uh, she's a ISIM research professor at Georgetown University and a non-resident senior fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. She joined ISIM in the fall of 2015 after serving for nine years as a senior fellow and co-director of the Brookings Project on Internal Displacement and as an adjunct professor in Georgetown School of Foreign Service. She served as the interim director of ISIM ISIM for the 17-18 academic year, where Catherine Donato was on sabbatical. Prior to joining Brookings in November 26, uh, 2006, uh, Elizabeth spent 20 years working in the field of international humanitarian response, most recently in Geneva, Switzerland, and the World Council of Churches. She has been a professor at several U.S. universities and served as a Fulbright professor to the, universe, to the Universidad Autónoma de Mexico in Mexico City. After hearing from uh, Professor Ferris, we'll hear from Professor Cecilia Menjivar. Cecilia Menjivar holds the Dorothy L. Mayer Social Equities Chair and is Professor of Sociology at UCLA. She specializes on immigration, gender, family dynamics, social networks, and broad conceptualizations of violence. Her research explores the impact on immigration laws and enforcement on immigrants and the effects of multi-sided violence on individuals, especially Central American immigrants. She also focuses on the political, uh, political state and judicial failures that sustain gender-based violence in Central America. Her, her more uh, recent publication is the Oxford Handbook of Immigration Crisis. I mean, here is both uh, John uh, S. Guggenheim Fellow and uh, Andrew Carnegie Fellow. She has served as Vice President of the American Socio Sociological Association and is currently President of the uh, I ASA, I'm sorry, 2021-2022. Let me just add a personal note on, on uh, Cecilia. I've known so Cecilia for many years. Uh, and I all, all, also endeavored to her. She encouraged me to pursue an uh, 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 graduate studies here in the United States many, many, many years ago. After Cecilia, we will, we will hear from Carla Cueva, who is the former Minister of Human Rights of Honduras. 
She's currently an independent consultant on issues on development and social protection uh, of human rights and the development of laws, regulation, public policies, and programs on trafficking and commercial exploitation. Uh, Minister Cueva is a lawyer from the National Autonomous University of Honduras and holds a master's degree in advanced studies of children's rights from the University of Fribourg and the Institute uh, Universitaire Corbusch in Switzerland. She also served as assist, assistant minister of human rights and justice for Honduras and an assistant minister of social policy of the Ministry of Social, social Development from 2010 to 2012. So thank you all for joining in this program. So I, 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 I give the floor back to you, Rafael. Thank you, Jose Miguel. And well, as you can tell, we have a, a wonderful panel and uh, uh, with, with it, with three different visions of, of what's going on in, in, in migration. Uh, and, uh, and I will give the floor first to Beth Ferris. Uh, Beth and I, we've been participating as well as Jose Miguel in the North and Central American Immigration Task Force. And uh, it's a group of Canadians, uh, Americans, Central Americans and Mexicans that we've been getting together to try to seek for solutions. Uh, we agree with Cecilia, there's been a crisis uh, evolving in the border for the last decade or so. Uh, in the borders, I would put it that way, because it's not only the U.S.-Mexico border, it's many borders. And uh, and uh, so please, fair, uh, uh, Beth, uh, we all call you Beth, if you don't mind. And uh, as you can tell, she has uh, lots of experience in dealing with migrants and, uh, and with refugees. And it's been a pleasure to work with you the last year. Please, the floor is yours, Elizabeth. And the idea is you will have about 25 minutes, each one of you, um, 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have like another 30 minutes for Q&A. But it always appreciated if we could have a good time uh, to Q&A. Go ahead, Elizabeth, and thank you for being with us. Great, thank you, Rafael, for that nice introduction. And, and kudos to Jose Miguel for putting together this wonderful program. I mean, it's really impressive, the, the issues you're, you're covering and the people you have speaking. And, and I hope there's the opportunity for some dynamic back and forth and exchange on some of these issues because their migration in the Americas, I can't think of a more relevant and hot political topic where expertise is needed from lots of different, different sources. And thanks, too, for the opportunity to talk about about the work of the North and Central American Task Force on Migration. This has been an exciting initiative. Uh, I think the group has worked very hard over the course of almost a year. And you know, now the really hard work comes of translating general recommendations into, into practice, into policies that affect the lives of those who are migrating, thinking about migrating, returning home, and involved in some aspect of the complex world of migration. So I'm going to share my screen and just go through a, a summary of some of the results and you know what this task force is and what we've we've tried to do. So the idea that was behind this was first of all too many Central Americans are forced to leave their homes in search of protection or survival. You know we've certainly seen increases in the number of Central Americans making that difficult journey through Central America, Mexico, often stopping or stopped at the U.S. border um, in, in search of, of, of a better life. You know, while the idea also behind this initiative was one, there's, there's a problem with too many Central Americans who are migrating, forced to leave. Um, and at the same time, while the U.S.-Mexico border has been a flashpoint for years, all countries in the region are affected and all must play a role in resolving the crisis. As our chair, Lloyd Axworthy, who you'll hear from later this afternoon, often said, you know, this issue is too important and too complex to leave to any one, to leave to any one country. We need the expertise, commitment, political will from all countries involved in the region. So the World Refugee and Migration Council, which was established after the Global Summit on Refugees back in 2016, the World Refugee and Migration Council was organized to take a look at the whole international refugee system. This council composed of people from all over, all over the world, all regions from different backgrounds, uh, met over the course of about two years to look at the systemic problems with response to refugees, concluding that the failure of responsibility sharing, that the changes that we were seeing and how people were treated when arriving were simply not adequate, that the systems and frameworks that have been developed in the immediate 
period after World War II were no longer relevant. You know, so the World Refugee and Migration Council considered all of these issues at the global level, looking for ways to improve the system of responding to people on the move. So as part of that, Lloyd Axworthy, again, our esteemed chair of the, of the council, said, let's, let's set up a task force of knowledgeable, committed people from Central America, Mexico, US, and Canada to really put their heads together, to engage some of the, the brightest unorthodox minds in the region to see if there were suggestions we could make to, to deal with the issue of Central American migration. Um, I say Central American migration, but as we know, migration is more complex than that. And we're seeing you know, other nationalities, whether it's Venezuelans or Haitians or now Ukrainians and Russians and Indians and Turks and, and others who are making this difficult journey. But the focus has really been on on Central America, and particularly the three countries of Northern Central America. So the, the task force was put together, it's really co-chaired by a number of esteemed people. We were, of course, devastated to learn of the death of Madeleine Albright, who worked very hard on the, on the task force and gave us a lot of very useful advice, particularly in how to approach the US government on some of these issues. But we had, you know, people, uh, uh, Mayu Avila from, from El Salvador, Julieta Castellanos from Honduras, uh, Father Giarello from the Scalabrinis um, based, in, based in Rome, but very active in the re region. President Laura Chinchilla, former president of Costa Rica, Silvia Gerguli, president of the Colegio de Mexico, uh, brought in uh, the faith-based sector with um, Cardinal Alvaro Ramazzini, um, Bishop of Huehuetenango in Guatemala. So those were the co-chairs. Then there were about 30 other people who were engaged, committed in some way, including Raphael, the chair here, and uh, Carla that we'll hear from a little bit later in, in this session, as well as Jose Miguel and academics and practitioners and former government uh, leaders and civil society representatives and representatives of faith-based organizations. So this was the group that was set up so the process that was followed was first to look at this issue of Central American migration and to try to break it down so we could focus intensively on some of the main issues. We began by looking at humanitarian protection in the region, particularly the situation of women, children, situation of uh, internally displaced persons, which never gets nearly enough attention when you're looking at displacement in Central America or, or anywhere for that matter. So we started by looking at humanitarian protection in the region with the idea that if, if people are safe where they live, there will be uh, less of a compulsion to, to seek protection elsewhere. We looked at regional cooperation and co-responsibility. What are the structures we have for coordinating policies, approaches on Central American migration? We, we heard from a number of people working in organizations associated with the UN High Commission for Refugees, with SICA, the Central American uh, Integration System, with the International Organization for Migration, some of the ad hoc platforms that have emerged and trying to see what role broader regional cooperation could play in coming up with some solutions for the present situation. We then looked at what's driving migration um, and, you know, sometimes in the media, the immediate response to migration is to provide more economic aid. But the feeling of the task force was very strong that, yes, there are economic and environmental drivers of migration. But the more fundamental issues of corruption, accountability, rule of law have to be tackled first. Um, the, the task force felt that, you know, simply increasing economic investment in the area, even in sectors where such investment is needed wouldn't be sufficient, that you really had to tackle these political and institutional drivers of migration. So we looked at those, we looked at economic and environmental poverty, inequality, um, as well as climate change and some of the long-term effects on the region. We then looked at alternative migration pathways I mean, it's, it's, it's very obvious the reason there's so much irregular migration from Central America is simply that there aren't enough regular ways, authorized ways for people to move. And we considered how to come up with 
better, more and more coordinated pathways so that migrants wouldn't have to take these terribly risky journeys. And we close with the issue of integration. You know, what happens after Central Americans arrive? What support do they receive to be integrated into the societies in which they're living? Which brought us to the question of narratives around migration, thinking that in order to increase integration and acceptance of Central Americans, we need to change the, the narrative and to emphasize the many talents, resources that um, Central Americans bring. As we heard in the opening statement of this, of this conference by um, uh, Luis Guillermo Solis, uh, you know, immigrants pay a lot of lot of taxes and contribute directly to the economy, but certainly there are many other benefits as well. So we set out these six areas. Uh, for each of them, we consulted widely with governments, academics, civil society, including faith-based organizations to get their input. Um, in particular, we relied heavily on input from local civil society organizations, from um, academics working in the region. We commissioned 12 research papers to support the work of these six thematic areas, which are available online. And then we debated the issues and drafted recommendations in working groups over the course of six months. So we had these 30 or 40 people and you know, we, we'd work in smaller groups. Sometimes we'd bring in other people to support the deliberation. So when we talked about economic um, difficulties in Central America, we engage with various private sector initiatives to talk about you know, different per perceptions of what the issues were and how they could be addressed. Um, we, we produced five interim reports on the first five of these issues, um, which are also available and provide some of the background analysis and data that inform the discussion. So the high level takeaways you know, came up, as always, these processes with, with many reports and written recommendations, but here to summarize them into four big takeaways, they would be first, we need a comprehensive strategic regional approach to address migration from northern Central America. These issues are too complex for any one government that the structures we have um, while serving useful purposes on specific issues. Um, you know, fail to provide this comprehensive strategic approach that would involve Canada, US, Mexico, and, and Central America, both countries in Northern Central America and others such as Costa Rica that are also affected. The governments in Northern Central America must address the political, economic, and institutional drivers of migration. There are no quick fixes. This is not something that's going to be accomplished overnight. But we really need a commitment, a political commitment from, from all parties to invest in making these changes that may not be visible for a few years. And you know, I think there's been a tendency to look for quick fixes to, to migration in Central America and certainly in other regions as well. We conclude that the U.S., Canada, and Mexico must all increase legal channels for Central Americans to migrate, and suggesting that be done through both labor migration and protection pathways. And finally, and this was a theme that came up in all of these working groups, that all regional actors from the governments in the region to donors to financial institutions must find ways to support the active engagement of civil society. We heard from civil society leaders from, from several of the countries that you know, there, were, there were direct threats to their work, that their space to operate was becoming more limited, that they needed international support financial, moral, emotional, political, in order to continue to play the important roles they, they, that they've been playing. So I'll just go through those various areas and not to talk about all of the recommendations, but just to pull out one or two recommendations from each of these areas. You know, first, and maybe this overarching goal of the need for a comprehensive regional approach. Um, is manifest in this recommendation to establish a new North and Central American Council on Migration. And the idea here is to learn from the Arctic Council, which has been a, a very creative, flexible, and inclusive um, mechanism for coordination of various issues, particularly environmental issues in the Arctic. I'm sure Lloyd Oxworthy will talk further about that um, this afternoon as he was instrumental in getting the Arctic Council 
start as well. But so this is a group of, of governments, but with a rotating chair. And we have representatives of migrant communities, civil society organizations, academics, and the private sector as full participants. This is what happens in the Arctic Council with indigenous groups, where they have virtually an equal seat at the table with governments to, to discuss how to coordinate and plan and respond to and um, my, migration in the region. So that's probably our, our central conclusion. Secondly, and we spent a lot of time on the issue of protection of people in the region because the, the reports from civil society, governments, and others are, are chilling. Um, we, we suggest prioritizing women, children, indigenous populations, and IDPs, internally displaced persons. So making a concrete suggestion that women's organizations and networks take the lead in organizing a regional me meeting to develop a consortium that would you know, set their own priorities, let women's groups decide what are the priorities for ensuring better protection of women in the region. Because they would set the priorities and make decisions about funding. We felt like these issues were too important for, to be made by donors sitting in distant capitals and really wanted to put women in, uh, in, in the driver's seat in terms of developing strategies to address their protection issues. Um, related the issue of children and certainly the number of children and unaccompanied children who are presently migrating from Central America is of deep concern. Uh, or, you know, we suggest that we have a, an, another meeting in the region with UNICEF and other child-centered NGOs and others working on the area to really assess what's, what's working, what could work, what needs to be supported to look at community-led mechanisms for upholding the rights of children, including those who are displaced or, or migrants or potential migrants to see what measures have worked and could work in the future. Um, certainly we see through, throughout the region in Central America, as well as Me Mexico, the need to support asylum. Uh, we heard particularly poignant pleas from Mexico for the need to build up Mexico's capacity to deal with uh, rapidly expanding number of asylum requests from Central Americans who, who want to stay in Mexico. That needs more support. And at the same time to address the issue of internal displacement. We know that people are often displaced internally four, five, six, 20 times before they set off on the more dangerous journey outside of the country. So enabling people who are displaced within El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala to find protection and assistance um, would play a role in reducing the pressures to migrate internationally. In developing alternative pathways, we recognize that a lot of the migration from Central America is driven by a combination of factors. It's both you know, criminal violence and lack of opportun economic opportunity and um, concerns about you know, violence against women, environmental factors. But we, we follow the traditional binary system of looking at labor migration and protection pathways. You know, already there are existing bilateral and multilateral agreements that to increase labor migration pathways. And you know, we suggest those be looked at again and expanded. A recommendation not, not listed here is to consider the possibility of new programs to encourage migration for the, for the care worker sector. Um, certainly US, Canada, perhaps even Mexico, you see growing need for people to care for the elderly in childcare. And you know, there could be a special program to support particularly Central American women to have a legal way of, of migrating for labor. We also you know, suggested moving away from these temporary labor migration schemes to provisional labor migration schemes, you know, where someone would migrate for a period, say, of three years, and if they do a good job and don't have a criminal record, they could extend that and have a pathway to permanent residency and eventual citizenship, that that would provide more stability for these programs. In terms of protection, you know, the United States and Canada in particular should expand these protection pathways. You know, we know about asylum and refugee status, but now we see complementary protection, temporary protection, humanitarian parole. You know, what among those is working or could be expanded to meet the needs of Central Americans who leave their countries or seek to leave their countries because they don't feel safe? 
tackling the political and institutional drivers. You know, here we identify corruption as one of the central issues generating migration. You know, supporting some of the civil society and academic efforts already underway to identify bottlenecks in the judicial system to protect human rights defenders who are monitoring and challenging governments on corruption issues and urge that steps be taken for a international anti-corruption court. Uh, it might be a parallel to the International Criminal Court, for example. Um, yeah, and, and then specifically looking at the need to um, professionalize, to move away from corruption in the security forces and to prioritize reforms in the penitentiary systems. You know, too often uh, penitentiaries, prisons become recruiting grounds for, for gang members rather than efforts to actually rehabilitate people involved in gangs and other forms of violence. In terms of economic opportunities, um, we suggest that you know, organizing a big international meeting in Central America, bring together the best thinkers in the region, representatives of international financial institutions, to think about a new broad initiative to really address the structural inequalities and forces that compel people to migrate. I mean, some people suggest that this might be like a Marshall Plan for Central America, although the situations are so different, Marshall Plan probably isn't the right the right term, but but some you know new out of the box brilliant perspective to to come up with some concrete ideas. And we talked about the need to formalize informal enterprises, especially micro informal businesses led by women and youth, as a way of giving people more social protection, more investment in the economy, and more opportunities to um, live lives of dignity while working in. Uh, occupations that have been in the informal sector. And then in addressing this thorny and uncertain issue of environmental migration, we, we know that slow onset and sudden onset disasters alike displace people, millions of people, certainly the large scale displacement in Honduras after the, the twin hurricanes of 2020 was a major factor. But we need to be thinking about how we deal with this migration, most of which will be internal. Our cities, municipalities prepared. What's the role of the national government? So a lot more work needs to be done on the issue of preparing for environmental uh, migration. And finally, to change the narrative and promote integration. You know, political leaders have a have a huge role to play in the way in which migrants are depicted in popular discourse. And a need to for for various actors to develop a common understanding of migration, to underscore its positive benefits and work to enhance the safety of all those who migrate. So there were lots of recommendations in this report. I mean, I think the group worked very hard. And the question becomes, now what? Is it just another report on another bookshelf? Or So the hard work be begins of advocating for these changes with governments, with various organizations working in the region, the private sector, civil society, faith-based initiatives, um, academics, and other stakeholders. So we, we hope this is really the beginning of, of changes and discussion and conversations on what needs to happen to address the issue of Central American migration. Some of the recommendations can be implemented right now. Most will take more time. We need patience, but we need commitment. And most of all, we need political will. So thank you, stay tuned. I look forward to hearing comments from Carla, one of our task force members and from Cecilia and answering questions whenever, whenever it's appropriate, thanks. Thank you, Beth. This is a wonderful summary of, of, of the, this uh, task force of the work we have been doing for the last almost a year. And, uh, and thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of uh, comments, but I, I will uh, I will not say anything because now is the turn of Cecilia Mejibar. Uh, please, Cecilia, uh, yours is the floor. Thank you so much, Rafael. Let me get my PowerPoint started here. Um, Oh, I need to share screen first. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, 
Okay, thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this conference, um, Jose Miguel, and for um, for the for for your presentation, um, Elizabeth, because it is my as you will see, my presentation complements what you have said very very well. Um, because I'm going to uh, talk about the role of the state in policy and politics, but from a different angle, very complementary to what you have said. And so I'm going to um, just quickly um, mention that just like Elizabeth was mentioning, um, that solutions and what can be done requires a coordination and collaboration across the states, across governments in the region. My, my comments today speak to collaborations and coordination, but not in the solutions, but in, in how those collaborations and, and what the states do have created conditions for this migration to happen. So whereas Elizabeth presented um, the, the, the end, what um, governments and, and states can do, I am going to talk about what they have done that has precipitated the migrations that we see today. So, for, um, so I just want to very quickly mention that, of course, Central American migration, um, historically, but what we see today um, has happened in the context of multiple upheavals, um, climate change, in, increased and increasing inequalities across the board, um, threats to democracy, economic instability, dislocations, not only in terms of internal population dislocations, but dislocations from formal structures, from formal markets, from, um, from institutions. And of course, um, in, the co in the context of migration, uh, population displacement internally, which again, as Elizabeth pointed out, we don't, we don't give enough attention to, but it's very integral to the overall migration patterns that we see from Central America today. So these are all very much interrelated. These are not single factors. You cannot, you cannot explain migration from Central America without taking into account all of these factors and maybe more. Um, so, I wanted to, to um, also mention this. In this context, can we talk about Central American migration as a crisis? Um, here, I want to highly recommend the work of the preeminent Salvadorian economist, William Pleites, who just wrote a book and is going to present his book at UCLA on April 28th. Um, it is a, the most comprehensive analysis of Salvadorian, of the Salvadorian economy. Um, it's, a, it's 200 years of the Salvadorian economy from um, independence to today. He wrote this book in, 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 um, in the context of the bicentenary of the independence of Central America. And I highly recommend it because once you, you read that book, you um, it opens up the historical lens and what we think of migration crisis is not a book about migration, it's a book about the Salvadorian economy that applies to the rest of the country too. But once that historical lens opens up, we take a different angle, we take a different look because what we may consider crisis today, it's part of a long historical process um, that helps us to understand why migrations and why population movements and why internal displacements happen today, why the inequality we see um, in, in the region, um, has how that has come about. And so I highly recommend that book. Um, so can we categorize Central American migration as a crisis? It is an open question because um, in taking this historical longer view, it is part of a historical um, process. 
And, but it is critical because once a migration, once a population movement, a displacement is categorized as a crisis, it activates responses, policy responses that start to treat that migration as a crisis. And it starts to, uh, to define it in narratives that present um, people participating in those movements in a different way. So this is again, um, reiterating what Elizabeth just said, how we portray people, how we categorize people is crucial for the responses and policy and public responses they receive. So this is an open question, but in my view, it is um, the migration from Central America, of course, has a very long history. And what we see today, it is a spike, but um, we need to, to think of the longer, um, the longer view. So these um, population movements, migrations, um, of course, when people um, wonder why and how they have come about, um, we tend to think of reasons, individual reasons for migration, um, fleeing violence, um, not having enough economic opportunities. Um, I, I, the, there are three or four top individual reasons for migration, individual motivations for migration. But we know, excuse me, I'm a sociologist, and, um, and we know from research that individual motivations are shaped by con contextual factors. And here, I want to center on the role of the states in creating conditions for this migration to happen for these population movements from the Northern Central American countries to, to happen. And for Nicaragua too, but I'm going to only, um, I, I don't want to leave Nicaragua out completely, even though they, the, that migration does not, um, does not come to the United States, it is, um, is, it is going to Costa Rica. Costa Rica is the, is the largest receiving, uh, the country of, uh, the largest receiving country of immigrants in Latin America today, followed by Chile, but Costa Rica's, for a bone population is 13%. So I don't want to leave out Nicaragua from, from this larger picture. And, um, but focusing on the three countries that we pay attention to in the United States, um, I want to focus on these um, interstate collaborations and coordinations um, that um, are, are key to, to understand um, how these migrations happen, and then um, see how those, those coordinations and collaborations can provide um, um, some form of, of answers or solutions to, um, to what we see today. Having said this, in, in emphasizing the role of the state and governments, I want to emphasize that I don't mean to treat the state as a homogeneous entity, because there are agencies within the state, different goals, different aims. Sometimes they are at cross purposes, but sometimes they coordinate. So I don't want to give the impression that governments and states all work together for the common goal, because there are different agencies with their own formal goals that may um, may have cross purposes in 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 creating conditions for migration, but also in the in um, in how um, they they um, they deal with migration. So, but still, I want to emphasize the central role of the state here. The um, the my my attention to the state comes from a very fundamental, basic principle, as um, Steve Gold and Stephanie Nowen um, mentioned, this, the existence of states underlies the very category of international migra migrants. For there to be international migrants, there needs to be the state power bounded with central geography and a state apparatus that allocates or denies migrant rights. And I would add that classifies people moving as deserving and deserving as refugees, as labor migrants. So it, the, the power of the state is central in the very 
act of migration, migrating internationally. The, so the role of the state in creating, sustaining, framing migration crisis, defining a migration in a particular way, can all, um, it's, it's, it should take center state because we only see the, the results of what states do in through the faces of anguished people escaping violent conditions from Central America today, for instance. It is the state that classifies individuals into immigrants or refugees, attributing categories to these movements, which make them seem quite different. But in fact, right now, as we wrote in that book on the Handbook of Migration Crisis, is very diff it has always been very difficult to differentiate exactly who is um, who, uh, who migrates for political reasons or for economic reasons, what, mo what motivates people when all of those factors coexist at the same time in the countries they leave. How to classify Syrian refugees, for instance, Syrian migrants, when they leave conditions that um, where all those factors are present. The same thing for Central America how to classify people fleeing conditions in Central America. Are they economic migrants? Are they labor migrants? Are they economic uh, um, refugees? Are they asylees? All of these coexist. It's just that, that we, we continue to abide by the categories that have been created to categorize people who move, but conditions often spill over those categories. And so we also have to think about that. So I'm going to start with the role of the sending state. Then, then I'm going to um, say a few words about the transit states, and then I'm going to say a few words about the, um, the receiving state. So the sending states of the three Central Amer Northern Central American countries, um, states create policies, um, create policies that then create conditions for exit, as we know economic policies that don't protect the interest of the overwhelming majority of the people and amplify and continue to amplify inequalities. Lack of access to education that can be converted into dignified jobs. Research has shown this. Um, lack of access to well-paid jobs in the formal economy or support for the informal economy or, or for support for um, other forms of, of employment. Um, healthcare is difficult to access, especially in rural areas. Conditions um, have worsened by natural disasters related to climate change. We have the, the, the dry corridor in Central America, for instance, that we have to think about. Um, and all these conditions have happened contemporarily, but also historically. And this is, I want to emphasize this. And um, so, the sending states have created conditions that propel people to consider migration as the only option sometimes that they have. And um, so we have children, women and men, um, often see no other future, no future in their, in their countries, but to migrate. In fact, we have interviewed um, deportees in the three North and Central American countries and they, after a couple of deportations from the United States, they still are planning to migrate. We interviewed a, a, a man in Honduras who after two deportations still was planning um, uh, uh, to migrate to the United States again within a month after we interviewed him. But, um, and while the sending states um, have become security sized, militarized, um, demonstrating quite a high level of, um, of power to control. At the same time, there's a contradiction there. Um, there's a lack of protection from violence that can come from inability or unwillingness, who knows, but there is a lack of protection. At the same time that they show quite a bit of power, there's a lack of protection. Um, and sometimes, agents of the state participate directly in the violence that spirals and then creates more violence. So sometimes these states look weak or unable to, in terms of protecting vulnerable groups from violence, 
but um, we have to keep in mind that they have expanded militarization and securitization, so they have demonstrated that they have the capacity to, to do that. So, but they, at the same time, they don't protect, especially the most vulnerable groups in the region. Sending states um, seem to be, from the research I've done, um, seem to be, for the most part, either unwilling or um, unable to protect women and girls from violence. I focus on gender-based violence in the region. Um, with, um, in coordination with the UNHCR, we conducted a survey of women who had, who were seeking asylum in the United States, 60% of them um, reported attacks, sexual assaults, rapes, and when they went to authorities, they received no protection. They were ignored and turned the other way. Um, so they, I, I can talk more about um, gender-based violence in the region because that is the project I'm working on right now, but I just wanted to highlight this seeming contradiction of what states are doing in the region with regards to violence. At the same time, I don't want the focus to only be on the sending states because it would be incorrect to focus only on conditions the sending states are creating without considering the conditions that the receiving, the wealthy receiving state of the United States has contributed to create. Sending countries don't create those conditions alone independently of the wealthy country, for instance, the United States. That's a given. Um, especially that um, we're talking about smaller countries, weaker economies, they don't create those conditions alone. As Saskia Sassin observes, migratory flows don't, don't just happen. They are produced and migrations don't just involve any possible combination of countries. They are patterned, historically patterned. And as Heba Gawayet notes more recently, People arrive to the very countries whose foreign policies have subjugated either them or people like them, and whose domestic policies are patterned by the same racisms that facilitated those foreign policies. So foreign policy is central in, in this regard. How the receiving state has contributed to create those conditions that people are feeling from, in which case we also have to think about responsibility of the, send, of the receiving state in receiving migrants or asylees or refugees, however they want to classify um, people fleeing um, when they arrive to their, to their, um, to their um, border. Um, so it, this, is, this is another piece of the puzzle of how we, um, we need to understand migration from Central America as vast and multifaceted, um, and the U.S. role in creating those conditions um, through market expansions, multinationals, creation of dependent economies, militarization, interventions, dislocations, the list is, goes on and on. So here is attention to the, the U.S. state, the U.S. government, in um, creating those conditions and maybe taking some responsibility for creating those conditions as well. Transit countries um, in spaces of strategies as spaces of uh, strategies and remote control. We know that um, borders have expanded inwardly and outwardly, internally in the United States through enforcement and control, outwardly through sourcing and externalization of borders. I'm so glad that you're going to show the documentary, The Vertical Border, because this is what I'm talking about here. Um, state policies of remote control that wealthy nations use to control migration, as Dave Fitzgerald has argued, um, through legal maneuvers, pressure in, on transit countries to keep migrants. We see that this around the world, in Australia, former um, European countries, North Africa, Mexico, and so on, Guatemala, and the, because the, the vertical border continues to expand and expand and expand through militarization um, to keep more migrants from arriving on, um, at US borders. There is, of course, the role of the receiving country in transit countries that we cannot forget. Um, transit countries don't keep migrants on 
on their soil on their own. Um, wealthy nations, in this case, the United States, um, often engage, engage of, um, trusted countries who are also um, have um, a weaker dependent relation with the, with the wealthier country. Um, to shift control to spaces outside the territorial border. So the United States has been outsourcing its borders, as we know, um, creating that vertical border that extends all the way down to Guatemala and El Salvador as well, providing financial and military support to expand those borders, sharing technological innovations and surveillance systems, and creating similar systems of enforcement in transit countries. We see detention facilities in Mexico, for instance. Um, um, uh, Alitha, um, oh my goodness, um, the, name the name escapes me, um, a wonderful scholar in Mexico doing work um, on detention facilities um, of Central Americans in Mexico um, comes to mind. Through this, um, because wealthier nations, and I'm talking about the United States, of course, but I, I just don't want to lose sight that this is part of a global um, system and process, um, have used um, militarized techniques to control um, their borders. Um, the expansion of the border then means the expansion of militarized um, strategies to, to keep more migrants from even reaching the, 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 the wealthy country's borders. So Mexico responds to this so-called crisis by extending temporary protected visas and creating an enforcement system that mirrors the US enforcement system. Um, US policies and bilateral agreements with Mexico and other regional governments are effectively dismantling the system to protect refugees and asylum seekers and militarizing life in migration corridors. This is very important because um, non-migrants, non-migrant communities um, throughout the corridor, and I'm not talking only about Mexico, I'm talking about how the, the expansion of the, of the border brings violence to that corridor, um, spirals, and then um, it, it fuels images of migrants bringing crime, bringing um, violence, bringing disorder to those to those corridors. So it results in increased vulnerability for poor migrants, kidnappings, we know that. We, we know what has happened um, in migration corridors throughout the world, but especially in, in, in the region. Um, but it also increases, of course, violence for non-migrants in the, in the migration corridor. It, it, this is very tied to how we define how these migrations are defined. Um, a crisis activates a response, a quick response that usually relies on, um, on the use of force, the use of enforcement through militarized techniques and, and strategies to respond, but then creates more violence and, and spirals violence that then conforms to this image of, of something is out of control, that we need to do something in the and the quick fix tends to be um, the use of military force um, that accompanies the, extent, the expansion of the, of the border. So now at my last point here is um, the receiving state and bureaucracies of displacement at destination when they arrive in the United States. Um, border security and enforcement um, responded are activated in response to this crisis, because we're in crisis mode, um, to allow in as few asylum seekers as practically possible. This is also where we see the classificatory power of the state to place immigrants in different legal categories, documented, undocumented, in between, each with varying degrees of rights and anchors in receiving society. Um, so framing immigration spikes as crisis that justifies more enforcement often serves a political purpose as well. Creates policies that criminalize immigrants in the United States, um, expands definitions of crimes um, for immigrants but not for others, um, rather than recognizing immigrants' 
fight for protection and treat them in moving them to the category of undocumented immigrants um, activates other responses, of course. Um, it places them out of status and it subjects them to a plethora of enforcement practices, detention, detection, detention, deportation. And we know that the highest numbers of people who are subject to these three um, um, enforcement um, strategies are migrants from Mexico, in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. They um, make up 80% of people in this, in, in the enforcement apparatus, um, but um, men from these four countries make up over 95% of people in, in this enforcement apparatus. Again, this comes about from classifying people into um, uh, um, a an out of, stat uh, out of status category of undocumented or, uncer or, or, or of an uncertain in between status as well. Here, I want to come back to my, a point I made earlier that states are not homogeneous entities. They have different agencies that may work as cross purposes. Not all state agencies work for the same goal. And state actors often work in collaboration with non-state actors in the work they do. So I want to highlight the work of Chiara Galli here, who has been um, doing, um, who has a new book actually on um, unaccompanied migrant children from Central America. And in that, in her work, she notes that Central American um, 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 unaccompanied migrant children are come in as they seek asylum, they are often treated as undocumented immigrants. So they are forced to, and they, they are subjected to enforcement, excuse me, but they are also minors. So this leads to a combination of trust because the, the minors seek protection. And so they trust the institutions in the United States that will protect them. But at the same time, they fear the punishing side of the immigration system. So it is, um, it is work that reminds us that not all agencies within the state, within the government work for the same um, goal. On the one hand, we have the protective part of the side of the state um, that protects children, um, but at the same time, it works at cross purposes with the enforcement side that um, seeks to, um, uh, that has the punitive side for um, their undocumented status. So what can we say about the role of the state in the case of migration? Multiple manifestations through various agencies, sometimes conflicting, but also something very often, of course, operating in unison. States create, sustain, and control migration, migratory flows, often through collaborations across states. And um, so I want us to think of state actors, of the complexity of when we think about this, the role of the state, to think of the complexity this implies, because there is a regulatory side to this, there's a punitive side, but there's also a protector and guarantor of rights. And this is what a lot of asylum seekers from the region are coming for. Um, they, they see the side of, 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 the, of the state, of the government as protector of rights, even though there's a punitive side that they have to also consider. And I think I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cecilia. This is uh, very, very good. And obviously, as, as you said, so it, 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 it very much is very complementary with what Beth has to say. Uh, you basically explain, I mean, how the state operates and, uh, and, and wonderful. And, uh, and thank you very much for bringing the state back. Uh, this is the central actor of migration flows and, and we, we should not get distracted with other actors. Thank you. This is very, very good. So now we'll go to for our last panelist and uh, Carla Cueva. And please, Carla, this, uh, yours is the floor. Adelante. 
Thank you for thank you very much and thank all for the honor to collaborate and contribute to this important and urgent issue, uh, not only in all the Americas but also in the world. I want to ask if I can share some ideas in Spanish. I think I am more passionate in Spanish than in English, and I will continue in Spanish if you allow me. Um, Creo que es importante eh, el poder enlazar las ideas de Beth, que ha hecho todo el trabajo de plasmar el esfuerzo de, de años de trabajo de, de este fabuloso grupo de trabajo que ha condensado eh, horas y días de, de, de investigación muy profunda y, y se une mucho con lo que Cecilia decía no la importancia del rol estatal, cómo eh, se visualiza el rol del Estado en el fenómeno migratorio. Eh, a mí me gustaría quizá profundizar un poco más en el contenido del, de los reportes. Hay muchísima riqueza de información en los reportes de este maravilloso grupo de trabajo y me gustaría poder retomar algunas de las de las eh, de los factores determinantes de la migración en Centroamérica partiendo también del ejemplo que vivimos eh, en países quienes vivimos en países como Honduras Guatemala y El Salvador eh, en primer lugar destacar que eh, creo que nadie quiere dejar voluntariamente su hogar su familia o su comunidad eh, el, los informes ya destacan que la mayoría de los migrantes centroamericanos desde hace mucho tiempo eh, citan particularmente las condiciones económicas como el motivo de la decisión de abandonar sus países y sobre todo la dura decisión de abandonar su familia, su hogar y su comunidad. Eh, para algunos es la, la única razón porque ya no pueden sobrevivir donde están. Y tal como lo decía, creo que ver también Cecilia, porque se ha perdido la esperanza. Eh, otro de los factores eh, que se ha agravado, creería yo, en los, en los últimos años, en las últimas décadas, es la pérdida de los medios de vida, eh, especialmente por las presiones medioambientales, como lo dice en el estudio, como la sequía, los huracanes y los efectos a largo plazo del cambio climático lo vivimos en el año 2020 en Centroamérica, particularmente en Honduras, agravado en un escenario eh, ya con pandemia eh, de COVID-19, agravado el escenario con eh, las tormentas Eta y Ota, eh, que también fue un triple determinante para muchos hogares para la pérdida de los medios de vida y de subsistencia y por tanto un factor eh, determinante para tomar la dura decisión de emigrar. Creo que eh, además de la, de la pérdida de los medios de vida, la necesidad económica, la necesidad de buscar eh, mejores condiciones de vida es el costo de la inseguridad personal debido a la violencia criminal eh, que se vive eh, particularmente en nuestros países. Eh, a mí me gustaría poder aportar al, a la detallada información que tienen los eh, estudios y, eh, y los reportes del grupo de trabajo que eh, el Instituto eh, Democracia y Paz eh, de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Honduras en el año 2019 desarrolló la encuesta sobre percepción eh, de victimización y en un escenario prepandemia, ¿verdad? Eh, los entrevistados aducían que entre las causas de la inseguridad, el 47.8% lo relacionaban con lo económico. Altísima la siguiente cifra, el 34.1% eh, 
causa de la, de la inseguridad era la corrupción y el mal gobierno. Y el 9.2 a las maras y al narcotráfico. Creo que como Cecilia lo, lo mencionaba, es importante hacer un alto también eh, y detenernos a analizar la violencia basada en género, especialmente en nuestros países. Eh, cómo la violencia basada en género es uno de los disparadores para la toma de decisiones para migrar. Eh, personalmente me tocó conocer casos de mujeres que eh, sin nada más que su ropa puesta eh, tuvieron que correr una madrugada solamente con sus hijos para poder huir del país debido a la extorsión y a las amenazas. Mujeres, muchas de ellas pequeñas emprendedoras que estaban sometidas a la extorsión o como se llama en nuestros países al impuesto de guerra. Eh, los altos índices de violencia y sobre todo los altos índices de femicidios en el país, especialmente en Honduras, eh, preocupa y creo que también dirigir la mirada a la violencia basada en género eh, para poder también eh, tomar decisiones eh, concretas pero también inmediatas. Durante el año 2020, se reportaron mensualmente en Honduras en promedio 27 muertes violentas de mujeres y femicidios según el Instituto Eliud Paz de la Universidad. Antes de eso, la Asociación Calidad de Vida, una organización de sociedad civil que trabaja con la violencia basada en género desde 1996, en 2018 reportaba que aproximadamente habían 15.000 huérfanos y huérfanas víctimas de las muertes de sus madres. Estos huérfanos viven con sus abuelas, con su familia eh, cercana y lamentablemente ausente de las políticas de protección a este grupo que probablemente eh, son de altísima vulnerabilidad a, a la figura que lo decía ya Cecilia de menores no acompañados, de recurrir a la migración para mejorar la calidad de vida de sus hogares. Aproximadamente seis de cada diez mujeres que sufrieron una muerte homicida residían en zonas urbanas del país, pero la situación de violencia que viven las mujeres en Honduras es generalizada y se registran muertes tanto en el área urbana como rural. Otro de los, de los grupos en altísima, altísima vulnerabilidad eh, que está sujeto precisamente a, a, a la violencia eh, es, son las personas desplazadas internamente. El estudio de caracterización del desplazamiento interno en Honduras del 2018 identificó 58.500 hogares en los cuales al menos uno de sus integrantes se desplazó internamente a causa de la violencia entre 2004 y 2018. Ya para 2018 eran afectados por el desplazamiento interno debido a la violencia 247.090 personas, o sea, el 2.7% de la población de Honduras. Interesante porque el 55% de los integrantes de los hogares desplazados son mujeres. Eh, la distribución es similar a la media nacional porque... Eh, según los datos del Instituto Nacional de Estadística, el 51.4% eh, eh, somos mujeres en el país. Sin embargo, la diferencia se acentúa en la jefatura del hogar, donde la presencia de una cabeza femenina en esos hogares eh, desplazados por la violencia eh, es de 5 puntos porcentuales, más arriba que en los hogares de comparación. Asimismo, la proporción de hogares monoparentales es superior en los hogares afectados por el desplazamiento interno, 11% frente al 7% de los hogares de comparación. Esta diferencia de cuatro puntos podría indicarnos dos cosas, que los hogares encabezados por mujeres son más vulnerables al desplazamiento interno por violencia ante situaciones de riesgo o inseguridad. 
o que el mismo desplazamiento forzado genera en ocasiones la separación del núcleo familiar. Eh, vinculado a la debilidad institucional y a la pérdida de confianza en el Estado, también el estudio de caracterización reflejaba una escasa confianza de los hogares desplazados y de la ciudadanía en general hacia los entes públicos. Solo el 22% de los hogares desplazados decidieron denunciar los hechos que les forzaron a dejar sus hogares y prácticamente la mitad de los que no lo hicieron señalaron tener miedo a sufrir represalias mientras que un tercio señaló que no servía de nada interponer las denuncias. Algo interesante de lo, que, de lo que resaltaba Cecilia era la, el rol del Estado y a mí me gustaría también en este caso unir el rol también de las organizaciones de base comunitaria o el papel que juega el tejido social eh, en, el, en el fenómeno, no únicamente del desplazamiento, pero también de la migración. Las personas desplazadas tuvieron más confianza para solicitar ayuda a las iglesias, eh, valoraron positivamente su labor de mediación, de sensibilidad y sobre todo de protección, así como los patronatos y las juntas de agua y otras organizaciones comunitarias. Yo creo que es importante eh, volver la mirada al enfoque territorial y al enfoque comunitario porque probablemente eh, eh, nos centramos en los niveles eh, supraestatales eh, cuando muchas de las soluciones a la, a, 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 al fenómeno migratorio y el del desplazamiento y la violencia están ahí fortaleciendo el tejido comunitario. Eh, igualmente, pues... Eh, lo que nos refleja y los datos que nos reflejan los, los reportes del grupo de trabajo eh, también nos refiere que no únicamente son los migrantes centroamericanos los que están viajando a Estados Unidos. Eh, nuestros países son eh, países expulsores de migrantes, sin embargo también se han convertido en países de tránsito y también de destino. A mí me gustaría destacar que, eh, de acuerdo a un estudio de OIM de julio de 2021, habían ingresado a Honduras de forma irregular, principalmente por las fronteras del sur. Eh, casi 17 mil personas, principalmente procedentes de Haití, de Cuba, Nicaragua, y otras nacionalidades procedentes de América del Sur, de Asia y África. Yo sé que este tema se va a abordar en el próximo panel. Eh, sobre todo es importante destacar que los migrantes extrarregionales presentan altos riesgos de vulnerabilidad, sobre todo pues eh, ya aunado al desarraigo, ¿no? el desgaste aparente que ya traen en su salud física y mental con enfermedades relacionadas con la deshidratación, con desnutrición, eh, y problemas físicos, ampollas en los pies, entre otras. Y estos migrantes extra, extra regionales o extracontinentales eh, aducen entre las razones para emprender el camino migratorio la búsqueda de mejoras en sus condiciones socioeconómicas, el desplazamiento por violencia o conflictos políticos y la reunificación familiar y una mejor calidad de vida. Eh, sumado a esto, y como ya anteriormente lo mencionábamos, eh, los impulsores ambientales, eh, los efectos del cambio climático en la región centroamericana eh, han impactado y siguen impactando eh, eh, precisamente a aquellas poblaciones más expuestas ¿no? a, los, a los desastres naturales. Eh, y especialmente cuando eh, los medios de vida, especialmente en las áreas rurales, están amarradas a la agricultura de subsistencia, ¿no? Eh, ausentes o muy lejanos 
a los sistemas de protección social como, los, como suele ser mucho más común en las áreas urbanas. Eh, y también la debilidad de los mecanismos de adaptación al clima, eh, la desigualdad de los ingresos y sobre todo también la informalidad ¿no? eh, del, del trabajo. Me gustaría también destacar en este sentido la situación de las mujeres y las niñas en los impulsores medioambientales. De acuerdo, de acuerdo a Christian Aid e Inspiration en el 2019, se establece que las dimensiones de género desempeñan un papel crucial en la configuración del nexo entre el medio ambiente y la movilidad humana, ya que las mujeres y las niñas suelen tener menos recursos para adaptarse al cambio climático y se ven afectadas de forma diferente a lo largo de todo el proceso de movilidad. Es mucho más común que se mueva el cabeza de hogar o los hombres o los varones de la familia a que la mujer que debe de permanecer en el hogar desempeñando eh, las labores tradicionales. Eh, la ocurrencia de desastres afecta en diferentes dimensiones la vida de las mujeres, expresándose en muchos casos en situaciones que reproducen la desigualdad de género, la violencia física, sexual y psicológica basada en género y la exclusión. Las mujeres empleadas en la agricultura son más afectadas por la degradación ambiental. Además, eh, el género es un factor que determina el nivel de riesgo de los individuos porque los recursos dependen de las normas socioculturales. Es el hombre, el cabeza de hogar, el que administra los ingresos, ¿no? Y entonces las mujeres están ausentes a esa toma de, de decisiones. La división de los roles entre hombres y mujeres en las áreas rurales de esta región ha sido impactada por los efectos del cambio climático, incluyendo a nivel de separación familiar. Cuando uno de los miembros de los hogares se inmigra en busca de oportunidades de empleo, y otros quedan expuestos a los mismos riesgos. En Honduras se vive un fenómeno que muy probablemente se esté viviendo también en, en Guatemala o El Salvador, en donde en las últimas décadas el cabeza de familia, el hombre cabeza de familia, toma la decisión de emigrar a Estados Unidos y la mujer jefa de hogar eh, frecuentemente toma la decisión de emigrar a España a trabajar precisamente en servicios de cuidado. Estamos viendo entonces hogares sin papá y sin mamá al cuidado de las abuelas o de los hermanos mayores eh, y en este caso ambos padres están separados eh, eh, en países distintos. Esto también es interesante poder, poder buscar quizá algún estudio que esté analizando este fenómeno. Eh, de acuerdo a un estudio de la OIM, de, del SICA y el CCAD del 2021, con relación a los niños y niñas se observó a través de estudios base que en los últimos años la sequía ha causado el aumento del número de menores que viajan no acompañados, enfrentando todos los riesgos que la migración implica. Esto pues eh, constituye un escenario preocupante dada la extrema vulnerabilidad de este grupo ya como se ha planteado eh, anteriormente en, en el país. Ante también los factores ambientales eh, o climáticos que impulsan la movilidad humana, es preciso ahondar en la generación de información eh, desagregada que nutre las políticas públicas integrales en materia migratoria eh, y que vaya más allá de identificar los factores como la violencia y la búsqueda de oportunidades económicas eh, y a, también profundizar en los determinantes eh, climáticos de la migración. Otro factor determinante es la pobreza. Eh, como lo dice el estudio eh, del grupo de trabajo, para casi todos la pobreza y la pérdida de esperanza de que las condiciones mejoren son factores que influyen en su decisión de desplazarse. De acuerdo a la encuesta de percepción sobre inseguridad ciudadana y victimización del IUPAS de la Universidad Autónoma de Honduras de 2019, el 65% de los encuestados en un escenario prepandemia 
conocía a alguien cercano que había emigrado al país en los últimos 12 meses. Y el 17% de los encuestados tenía planes de emigrar en los próximos 12 meses. Eh, esta encuesta nos reflejaba ya en, donde, en el 2019 que el 78.3% de la población que deseaba emigrar era por razones económicas, 8.3% por la inseguridad del país, 5.5% para buscar la reunificación familiar y 2.9% por alguna oferta laboral. También las, la encuesta nos reflejaba que ser víctima de algún hecho delictivo aumentaba en 10.8 puntos porcentuales el deseo de emigrar del país en relación a aquellas personas que no han sido víctimas. Eh, otro de los factores determinantes eh, de la migración es la debilidad del Estado de Derecho o la pérdida de confianza en las instituciones. Ya el estudio... Eh, y el reporte reflejaba los datos del latino barómetro eh, que reportaba un deterioro significativo en la confianza institucional entre 2014 a 2019 en América Latina, señalando que las tasas de confianza en las instituciones existentes son 63% expresó confianza en la iglesia o las iglesias, lo que nos remite también al rol de las organizaciones comunitarias o de sociedad civil. El 44% en la policía, 28% de las instituciones electorales, 24% de las autoridades judiciales, 22% en el gobierno, 21% en el Congreso y 13% en partidos políticos. Eh, en este sentido también la percepción de impunidad eh, es uno de los determinantes en la toma de decisiones para migrar, para desplazarse. Por eso el fortalecimiento del Estado de Derecho es fundamental para erradicar la corrupción, hacer frente a la violencia criminal y promover el crecimiento económico. Eh, en este sentido se hace necesario, urgente, el fortalecimiento de la independencia judicial, de la investigación y sanción pronta del delito, del acceso de las víctimas a la justicia, de la independencia y el fortalecimiento de las instituciones nacionales de derechos humanos, el fortalecimiento del periodismo y de la comunicación social, entre otras medidas, ¿no? como factores para eh, vigilar la conducta estatal como veedores y auditores sociales que prevengan la corrupción y la impunidad. Eh, los altos niveles de desconfianza en la institucionalidad pública nos lleva a destacar y fortalecer y, y, y a, 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 a abogar por el fortalecimiento del rol de la sociedad civil como veedores y auditores de la gestión pública, incluidos los medios y los comunicadores sociales. Eh, gracias al, al, al extenso y, y profundo eh, trabajo de este grupo de trabajo eh, que ha aportado eh, ideas novedosas pero también pragmáticas, eh, eh, yo me permito también compartir quizá algunos apuntes finales eh, derivados pues, de la lectura de los, de los reportes. Eh, es preciso tomar en consideración el enfoque territorial y local o comunitario en la búsqueda de soluciones a los factores determinantes de la migración. Que la comunidad se ha tomado en cuenta en la definición de políticas públicas integrales de desarrollo social, pero también económico. Eh, la importancia del sector privado como generador de oportunidades de inclusión laboral y generación de ingresos, especialmente de aquellos grupos altamente vulnerables, como las mujeres jefas de hogar, jóvenes, personas desplazadas internamente, eh, personas pertenecientes a pueblos indígenas, entre otras. Es preciso eh, evaluar el impacto de las políticas de protección social eh, implementadas en la región y asegurar la inclusión de los grupos de alta vulnerabilidad a la migración irregular, a las estrategias de focalización de dichas políticas. Eh, el fortalecimiento de los sistemas de salud y educación 
eh, analizar la importancia de la pertinencia entre la currícula educativa y la oferta laboral, el fortalecimiento de la inserción o intermediación laboral entre los jóvenes, las mujeres, pueblos indígenas y el mundo de trabajo para incentivar el trabajo formal o desincentivar la precariedad laboral. Eh, apoyar e instar a los donantes a que apoyen las iniciativas de sociedad civil que trabajan contra la corrupción en sus gobiernos y brinden protección a los defensores de derechos humanos y los medios independientes que denuncian la corrupción. Resaltar el importante rol del tejido social a nivel comunitario, apoyando las organizaciones de base. Eh, es urgente el diseño puesto en marcha de políticas migratorias basadas en evidencia actual, cambiando el enfoque de seguridad nacional a un enfoque territorial y participativo, un enfoque de corresponsabilidad, pero sobre todo políticas migratorias con enfoque de derechos humanos y finalmente el poner el rostro a los migrantes a sus familias, a los migrantes y solicitantes de asilo. No olvidar sus historias de vida y nutrir política pública basados precisamente en esas historias de vida. Eh, me quedaría aquí. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Carla Cueva. Uh, thank you very much, Carla Cueva. You, you uh, complemented uh, beautifully. Uh, with Cecilia and with Beth and, uh, and uh, well, this is very, very good. Let me make a very uh, uh, a comment uh, and, and then uh, we will open up for, for Q&A. We have plenty of time, uh, so I will take five minutes. So then we have at least half an hour for everybody to, to, to have a, a dialogue with the three panelists. And uh, well, first of all, uh, Beth Paris, he, uh, share with us uh, 12 recommendations that we've been working on them uh, for the last year. And I believe they're very accurate and she presented us with a comprehensive panorama. Thank you, Beth. But if I were to, to select one of those, if I were to underline one of those, I will stay, stick with one, which is we badly need the mechanism of consultation. Uh, if we want to have this uh, regional vision, uh, because it's impossible to deal with migration flows from a nation state. Uh, we really have to coordinate with the others. And, uh, and it's, it's key that Central America, Mexico, the US and Canada, we really put our act together. Otherwise we would not offer uh, any sort of, of improvement to migration flows, uh, to the management of migration flows. So I believe that is a very, very necessary to have this mechanism of consultation. And let me give you uh, I mean, two, two examples of why this is so important. I, I, I have the, the, the opportunity to work for President Calderon from 2008 to 2011. And, uh, and of course, uh, migration uh, was a very uh, uh, hard issue to deal with. And uh, I remember one crisis that we have in, in August 2010, and the crisis was awful, 72 migrants, mostly from Central America were, were shot killed in San Fernando, Tamaulipas. And it was awful. I remember vividly the day uh, that happened. It was in late August that year. And uh, uh, we were uh, in, in, in Puerto Vallarta coming back from the US. And, uh, and I remember when some, I mean, a, somebody called President Calderon and, and told him that this happened. I'll tell you something, there were no regional for, forum uh, to talk about this. Uh, eventually, just two and a half months later, uh, the Mexican foreign ministry put it together a, 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 a meeting by the uh, Conferencia Regional de Migración, the, 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 the Conference of Regional Migration. And I'll tell you, by then, Mexico was very defensive. Uh, by then, uh, I would say Mexico was able to dilute his responsibility in this awful act. But there were no other fora to be able to, to, to talk about this and to make sure that this will not happen again. I'll tell you something. Like five months before this happened, the delegation from El Salvador the government came to Mexico City and they aware us. You know, we've we, we seen a lot of violence against migrants. 
we're fearful that a bad event could happen and it suddenly happened uh, in San Fernando, Tamaulipas. Uh, so we badly need a place in which we Latin Americans could talk. So then we be able to uh, uh, make sure that this will not happen again. But then you might think that then Mexico has a lot of uh, uh, dialogue with the US. Not really, you wouldn't believe this. But uh, President Calderon uh, uh, dealt four years with Barack Obama and, uh, and I'll tell you, we thought that Barack Obama was going to be, I mean, and he was uh, someone who was very, I mean, he wanted to pass immigration reform. But in the first meeting we have with uh, uh, President Obama, in the second meeting, in the third meeting that we have with President Obama, the White House of President Obama didn't want us or refuse for the two leaders to talk about immigration. They say, they claim that Mr. Obama was trying to pass immigration reform. So therefore, it was not a good idea to talk to Mexico about immigration. I mean, we just couldn't believe it. I kept, I mean, we kept on talking to people at the, at the State Department and at, at the White House, but there was a refusal uh, from them for the two leaders to talk about this. Of course, President Calderon raised the issue, but it's not the same when you raise the issue, like, uh, nah, than when you really put this into the agenda of the president. And it's very important to put this into the agenda of the presidents because then the bureaucracies, the state apparatus start working on you. So, I mean, there were scarce dialogue, but, but I'll tell you. So, and then, for example, yes, President Trump <laughs> talked to Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador and to Peña Nieto about immigration, but he did it in a very specific way. He basically threatened Mexico, for example, uh, to put, uh, to create these barriers for Mexican trade into the US. So the talks were not about how to improve migration flows, uh, but it was about how can Mexico could help the US detaining Central Americans because otherwise Mexico would be subject to higher tariffs. And he was threatening Mexico to put tariffs all the way to 25%, which would have been devastating for the Mexican. So that is why I believe it's very necessary to have a mechanism of consultation and we're offering the possibility of doing one. Then let me say something about, um, about uh, Cecilia Manjibar's presentation. Uh, Cecilia, I love the way uh, you classify the state in the sending state, in the transit state and the receiving state. I believe that way we can really observe, I mean, the responsibility of the state, of the federal government in in migration flows. And, uh, and the, the term uh, vertical uh, uh, migration policy, it's something that I, that I, I mean, I know that, that uh, David Suchero has talked about it, but let me share with you an anecdote. And I was with Miguel, uh, Jose Miguel Cruz, in the first time that we went visiting Apachula, the Mexican southern border. And there we were visiting Padre Flor Maria Rigoni, uh, a, a Scalabrini priest, who had a, a very nice shelter for migrants there. And, uh, and I remember vividly that me, 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 Rigoni kept on talking about Mexico not having a horizontal border or a vertical border. And what he refers to it is that the Me Institute of Mexican Migration will deport migrants, sometimes from the southern border, but sometimes from Puebla, and sometimes from Veracruz, and sometimes from Tamaulipas, all the way in the border with the US. So, I mean, that's something that is there. And, uh, and, uh, and yes, uh, uh, thank you, Cecilia, because in, in, in the way you presented uh, the state uh, allow us to understand the critical role played by the state in managing these migration flows and in creating this animosity and criminalization against migration flows. This is wonderful. And, they, uh, uh, and Carla, thank you very much for, for sharing with us your passion uh, 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 on migration related issues. And of course you underline uh, how women, children and indigenous populations are subject to awful uh, things uh, in their way. I remember vividly again, the, I believe in one of my trips to the Southern border, uh, when, when we have La Bestia coming, I mean, the train, the cargo train that will transport uh, migrants 
uh, at the time, Tavares was coming to uh, through Tamauli, uh, to Tapachula, and that, that is only 30 kilometers away from the U.S. from the Mexico-Guatemala border. And I remember vividly there, and perhaps Jose Miguel will remember this. We, we saw a young woman, and we talked to, to her from Honduras, a mulata, a beautiful 17-year-old woman that she was shaking, and she was very scared because she was there waiting for the train, and she told us that she was coming to visit, trying to come all the way to Tennessee. She didn't know where was really Tennessee all about because uh, she tells us her husband was there. And uh, and it was uh, and she was trembling because she told us that it took her about ten days to come from Honduras to Tapachula, and uh, and then when she arrived in Tapachula early that morning, the woman asked her if she could, uh, if she wanted to have a bath in her place. So she bathed in her place. She took a shower there. Then this woman fed her, but then she took her into a into a uh, prostitution house. So, and then she fled that place and she was waiting for La Bestia, very nervous uh, and shaking because she thought that perhaps that woman or someone else could come and get her. And uh, it was very telling for us. And thank you, Carla, for reminding us that we have to put face to migrants. Uh, we're talking about large numbers and, uh, and, that's, uh, and that's not enough. Uh, and finally, I mean, to finish my, 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 my comment, let me tell you that now there's a very, we have a very complex situation in the US-Mexico border. Just last week in Tijuana, just one of the, one of the many cities in the US-Mexico border, this 2000 mile border, last week there were landing in the Tijuana airport, 2000 Ukrainians. And uh, that's the figure of the Migration uh, 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 Institute, uh, Migration Institute. And uh, they say at least there were 2,000. And you know what's happening with them? They land there and immediately they catch a cab, they come into the US and the US authorities are basically welcoming there. I mean, it's, uh, I understand and I'm glad this is happening to Ukrainians. President Biden has said that the U.S. will accept until 100,000 Ukrainians, and it's wonderful because it's so bad what is happening there, and there's already about 9 million of people displaced in, in, in Ukraine, uh, about five going outside Ukraine, and about four still staying in, in, in Ukraine. But you know, the problem we have in the border that there's Central Americans, there's Cubans, there's Venezuelans, there's uh, Russians that they've been waiting in Tijuana for months. So why all of a sudden Ukrainians are coming into the US? So we badly need to talk about these issues. And it's not only Mexico, it is the US and it's Canada because we have to put our act in order. So thank you very much again, Cecilia, Beth, and, uh, and Carla. The floor is open. I believe that this is, I mean, uh, in the Q&A, we I believe we have already some questions. And you tell me, Miguel, how can, how can we get some more questions? I believe it is through the Q&A. Yes, yes, through the Q&A. So anybody who wanted to make a question, you have, please use the Q&A uh, to address uh, our panelists. And we have, I think, three questions. Yeah, we have two questions. Uh, uh, Carlos Carpio is asking, is asking you, uh, panelists, where do we begin? Lots of things to do because there are lots of drivers of migration. For example, economic growth and strengthening of institutions will take years. Where do we start in the short run while working on the long-term ch changes? And let me ask an another one, and, and then I'll give you the floor to, uh, to the three of you. Uh, and this is uh, Jay Colon, Colon Burgo, Burgos. Does the task force have the ear of the presidents of the United States, Mexico, Canada, and the Northern Triangle? Well, Beth could talk about that, and I will say something after Beth talks, and perhaps if you, Miguel, want to, to say something. So, floor is open. Why don't we start with, uh, if it's fine with you, why don't we start with Beth, and then we'll go in the same order to Cecilia and, and to Carl. Okay, a, a couple of points. One, um, for that last question on whether or not the task force has the ear of 
presidents. I don't know. I think they have the ear of some senior government officials and their are plans to have a meeting in Mexico and Guatemala to talk with more high level officials. Um, in the United States, I think that the uh, Kamala Harris's office is certainly aware of our work and we have channels to provide that to her and other senior officials. But, but also related to the, to the first question, that is, you know, there are a lot of recommendations um, that can be carried out by different actors. This isn't just the responsibility of states. And so I think we need to think about parallel tracks of you know, civil society really pressing hard on some of the corruption issues in terms of you know, governments developing these alternative migration pathways. They can happen at the same time. Your fundamental point is absolutely correct though, and that some of these are, are longer term. And, you know, our diplomats aren't known for great patience to wait for some of these changes to take effect and the need over and over again for political will to implement some of these, some of these questions. Um, to pick up on what Raphael said as well, uh, the urgent need for consultation on a whole range of migration related issues. It's sometimes shocking to see governments developing these policies in isolation from one another when they're all interconnected. I mean, labor migration, for example, being determined by uh, Canadian and U.S. officials and not knowing which direction they're going in, you could have a lot of duplication or inadequate um, coverage for, for certain groups of workers. So there, I mean, I, I think that was the idea behind the proposal for this, this, this council to you know, have working groups and to really engage in consultation on lots of levels. And finally, Raphael, the, the point you made about discrimination and treatment of asylum seekers is certainly reverberating in the, in the global humanitarian world. I mean, as everybody rejoices in the openness and welcome for Ukrainians, as you say, they're facing a terrible situation and they they deserve to be warmly welcomed into countries that are receiving them. But so are other refugees and asylum seekers from countries where the, the levels of violence are very, very high. So I think that the whole Ukrainian situation is show, you know, shining a spotlight on some of the discrepancies and injustices in all of our systems of asylum. Thank you, Beth. This is very good. Cecilia, please. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, Rafael. And I want to um, follow up on one thing that um, Carla mentioned, and it's very important because I call the attention to what states do, collaborations at that level. But one thing that I also have found from my research in the region is the incredible and critical role of civil society organizations. So I want to absolutely support Carla's point because it is very often, they are the only ones doing something. It's, all, it's very often, it's women's rights groups, other civil society organizations that are doing something. So for instance, one thing that uh, uh, one response about what can be done could be to, um, to support the work the, of civil society organizations give them funds um, to support what they do because it's very often um, they're the only ones. Um, they accompany women to, to file um, uh, uh, claims um, for, for violence. They, they, they do work on the ground. So I want to absolutely emphasize that uh, um, Carla's point along those lines, civil society, is key here um, in, in how we think about what we can do. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, regarding, um, yes, Rafael, you, 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 you touched on a, on a critical point um, about the discrepancies in how people are received um, around the world, how different groups are received around the world, and, um, and following Elizabeth's um, comment, um, the, the Ukrainian, group has shined a light on the stark contrast because um, the, same, the same country is, is, is providing very different, very different, um, a very different narrative which activates different policy responses to, for instance, Syrians and Ukrainians in, in Europe. Um, Poland, 
on the one hand, receives Ukrainians in one way, classifies them in one way, but at the same time, rejects Iraqis. It, the same country does both. Um, and so, and we see this around the world. We see the activation of the temporary protective directive in the European Union for um, Ukrainians at the same time that Syrians and Iraqis are being spelled out or keeping um, African migrants contained in transit countries. So we see this very stark contrast in how, um, how the receiving countries, the wealthy receiving countries are classifying immigrants and how those classifications activate certain policy responses. In the United States, um, Ukrainians received temporary protected status in nine days, whereas Central Americans, um, Salvadorians and Hondurans who have been on temporary protected status for 20 plus years are being threatened to with ending that status. At the same time, the Ukrainians received it in nine days. What explains these discrepancies? I think we have to think of foreign policy here. The importance of this of, of foreign policy in responding to these to to these um, to these migratory flaws, with the United States, of course, there are relations with Russia, with um, the European Union. Again, it's a historic connection with Russia and how they see Russia, um, with um, the United States and Central America. Foreign policy, of course, plays a central role. So I think attention to foreign policy. Um, starts to unveil some of the um, and, and provide and reveal um, quest, uh, answers to this stark contrast that um, that we are leaning today. So thank you, Rafael, for bringing that up because um, I was going to mention it, but then I didn't want to distract attention from the Central American point. But it is crucial that we think um, about um, foreign policy as it plays a role in how refugees and asylum seekers are received. Central Americans have had this, have lived this for 40 years because since the 1980s, Central Americans have been denied the um, status of, um, have never been classified as refugees and only a small percentage, I think um, Elizabeth, you did some work on this early on um, that I have used in my own work. Um, so, um, so we know that Central Americans have have always had this ambivalent reception in the United States, which is tied to foreign policy in Central America. So that's all I wanted to say. But thank you, all of you. This is such a fruitful conversation. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, Carla, please. Yes, I want to add on the question of where do we start? How do we start? Hmm. I think, uh, first of all, um, we have to gain allies to this, to this struggle, no? Um, one of the best steps, I think, is this discussion. This conference, understanding in deep the, the, the issue, the, the problems, but also the characterization of the migration from Central America or from the Americas to the United States. Um, I think um, we have an asset in Central America. We have a very strong civil society. I think we are the region where the civil society is active and uh, also have achievements in some issues. For instance, in anti-corruption issues, civil society has been very active, no? Uh, I think we must uh, um, gain allies in the academy also to generate continuously, periodically, more information about the situation on migration and uh, asylum seekers to contribute to design very comprehensive public policies. In Honduras, I think we have the opportunity to have a new government that at least very committed with human rights. I think in Honduras, we have this new opportunity. But also, I think the role of civil society in faith-based organization 
have the advantage to go where in most times the state cannot be present, but it's not a substitute of the state, but civil society can nurture the decision makers and also um, can inform the decision makers and stakeholders um, to create a change, especially with evidence-based um, public policy, very currently evidence-based uh, public policies in our countries. Thank you, Carla. We have a, a this is very good, Carla. Uh, thank you for sharing all of this with us. Let me, uh, 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 there's another question here by MC Lemay. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for the presenters. My question, if, if you might be able to answer, is what is, the, what is the typical thought process for migrants, refugees in deciding where to flee and or migrate? I believe it's, a, it's an interesting question and I wonder if, if any one of you will, will want to, 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 to take a crack of it at it. And, uh, and then why don't we, uh, since we only have 10 minutes to go, why don't uh, I will give you now the floor in the inverse order. We will start with Carla. And, uh, and why don't you share with us your final remarks? I mean, uh, what I, I mean, I believe that uh, uh, you all have talked about civil society, the importance of civil society. You're absolutely right, Cecilia and Carla and Beth. I mean, in Tijuana, uh, what makes a difference, it's civil society and religious groups. Uh, I mean, they really make a difference. That explains, for example, why the Honduran caravan of October uh, 2018 came all the way to Tijuana, which is the triple distance from the, neck, from the border with Guatemala than to Laredo, because they knew that there's a lot of organizations in Tijuana, very well-established migrant shelters that could support them. By the way, the first migrant shelter ever in Mexico was uh, built in Tijuana 32 years ago by Flor Maria Rigoni and Scalabrini. Then, then he had another uh, shelter in Ciudad Juarez. And then he was for 20 years uh, in, in Tapachula, Chiapas. And now, and now you know where he is? Well, he's in a very intense place of immigration, which is now Colombia, and basically he helping Venezuelans, which uh, Venezuelans, so the, the Scalabrines, they, they, they do really make a difference. So I wonder if you could tell us about, I mean, what would be your recommendations about civil society? Cecilia, what about, I mean, if you were going to, to advise a government, uh, now that we have a new president in Honduras, uh, what would be the one or two things that we would uh, uh, advise her to do? So why don't we start with you, Carla, then we'll go uh, uh, to Cecilia and we'll finish with, uh, uh, with Beth. And thank you again for these wonderful presentations and, uh, and you gave us a, a, a comprehensive panorama that I believe it's, it, it is wonderful for everybody listening to him. And, and hopefully, Jose Miguel, I mean, there's going to be a summary of this because I believe uh, we really have uh, uh, got outstanding ideas here about how to better manage migration flows. Adelante, Carla, please. Well, I think my first advice for the new government is to put the spotlights in grassroots organizations, because it's very frequent to work with on a national, very extensive organization, but it is in territory. It is in those communities where people are taking the decision to migrate that you can make a change. You can identify the people that is taking the decision. And also are these grassroots organizations and faith-based organization that can guide the targeting uh, strategies for the social protection and inclusion policies because they are near of the people. We have to take into account also the teachers in the small communities. They are very close to the homes, to the students. They know um, households, they know siblings, they know parents, uh, preachers, priests, the health system, nurses. I think 
we have to take into account this small organizations working on the social tissue in the communities. It is in the community where you can have the most current and actual data about the people that is at risk, at risk of taking the decision to migrate. For me, the grassroots organization, it will be one of the richest assets in the construction of public policies in the country, especially in migratory comprehensive policy. Thank you very much, Carla. Uh, Cecilia, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Following Carla, I also want to um, give a plug for um, uh, organizations um, in civil society. And because of the work I do, I have to emphasize the work of women rights organizations. Um, they have advanced laws to protect women um, from violence in El Salvador, for instance, in, in Guatemala, in Honduras. They continue to shine a light on this, what I call the other pandemic. It's not a, a pandemic, it's an endemic, the, 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 the issue of gender-based violence, not only in the region, around the world, but we're talking about the region. Um, so I, in the threat to democracy that I mentioned um, in my, my initial remarks involves, uh, what I was thinking about is that I, with the rise of militarized and authoritarian regimes in the region, we have seen a persecution of men's rights um, organizations. And the, instead of shutting them out, instead of silencing them, what we need is to support the work they do because gender-based violence, in my view, is critical and central to address in, in the region, not only for migration, but for the region as a whole. So I want to follow that. And to also emphasize something that Carla mentioned earlier that um, by supporting the, the work of, of organizations in civil society, we're not leaving the states off the hook. It is um, a coordinated effort that, um, because civil society groups can work until they turn blue and, not, and they don't have the formal, um, the formal power that the state has. So it has to be a coordinated effort, but to centrally give attention to what um, organizations do. And um, that has been shown in the United States with the um, with the, the the classification the treatment of Central American um, asylum seekers in the United States, where the the state does not provide them with the resources they need, but it is religious organizations in the United States, for instance, that have provided um, quite a bit of um, of support for asylum seekers from Central America historically. So um, I just want to emphasize those those two points. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Um, these are Zoom times, and if you please, it's, it's here, everything is live. I'm sorry. Uh, Beth, uh, uh, yours is the turn. I'm sorry. Sure, just, just very briefly, you know, absolutely civil society deserves more support and also more financial support. You know, studies by local groups in Central America show that, you know, less than 3% of millions and millions of dollars in USAID funds goes directly to local organizations. You know, that really needs to change. I mean, why is so much aid money spent in the country of the donor instead of the local organizations that are doing the work? So, so that's one. And then to respond to the question of where people decide when they decide to go when they decide to migrate. I mean, migration research shows very clearly that people, people go where there are social networks, where they know somebody, where they've heard about conditions in a particular area. It's much easier to make that decision when you have a social network, but also that it requires resources. You know, the poorest people don't have the funds to pay a coyote or to and take a bus, uh, you know, so it, it also, there's always a gap between people's aspirations and their ability to move. So these are complex issues, but, but thanks to Rafael and Jose Miguel for, 
for organizing the, this wonderful morning. And I'm sure the rest of the program will be equally fascinating. Well, again, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Carla. Uh, back to you, Miguel. Thank you, Rafael, and, and thank you all, all the panelists. Thank you, Cecilia, Elizabeth, Carla, to you, Rafael, for a fantastic, really fantastic panel. Uh, this has, you know, a lot of great, great ideas and the need to continue discussing in a comprehensive way the, the, the challenges of, of, of migration. So this concludes uh, uh, our first session of, of the conference. Uh, we have two more sessions, one starting at 1.45. Uh, I want to, um, again, thank you all. I invite you to the next to the next session in 15 minutes. We're going to uh, uh, close the transmission at this point, but I ask you to come back in 15 minutes for the next panel that will be on the many migration of the Americas. So we're not only talking about Central America, we're talking about the South-South migration, we're talking about specific migration from Mexico to the United States, which is also an important uh, my, uh, migration flow and, and, and the general view of migrations in the Americas. So thank you all again, I, and I'll see you in 15 minutes. Uh, please use the, the same link that you use to connect for this one. It's the same link to connect in 15 minutes. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much Bye. to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.